It's so good to be back. It's, it's wonderful to be back. And I've been looking forward to this webinar, the Confrontational Auditor, Don't Put Out the Fire, Redirect It. And for those of you who are not familiar with me and the Whole Person Project, I would just sum it all up by saying we basically profile for a living. We figure out why certain teams do better than other teams, what makes their performance so good, we deconstruct that, and then we put it into either a workflow or we put it into a training program or a webinar. So in designing this webinar, my hope for you is that you will walk away with some very practical advice that you can put into practice immediately uh, once the webinar ends. And I would just like to say that everything that we are going to talk about in terms of the techniques they are behaviors, and like any behavior, you can learn the behavior. If you practice any behavior enough, it becomes a habit. And so I hope you find some uh, positive habits to be in the content this afternoon. The way I've organized the webinar, I wanted to set the stage a little bit, so I, I did include some theory, for lack of a better word. If you were taking a course, in confrontation, I wanted to define certain terms and differentiate conflict from disagreements. And I also wanted to spend a little time, just a little time, talking about why conflicts happen. I'm sure most of you know why conflicts happen. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time about that. But from a technical perspective, I did want to just touch on the various sources of conflict. The majority of our time, though, I think needs to be spent on how do we need to deal with difficult people. And I think over and over again, I really hesitated when I wrote this, I, you know, how to deal with difficult people. Because in my heart, I really believe there really are no difficult people. There's really just difficult situations. But I went back and forth and forth and back, and I ended up with how to deal with difficult people. And so we'll talk about, we'll talk about that, and we'll end up talking about what to do when you are confronted uh, and how do you deal with, with, the, with the confrontation. And I will allow some time for, uh, for Q&A. I think the only thing that I would like to add to what Lark said with regard to the CPE polling questions, I spend time after every webinar looking over the feedback and thinking about it with an eye towards how can we make the webinars more meaningful. And I noticed in the last uh, webinar that I did, I was kind of chuckling because a couple of people wrote in, these are really kind of different CPE questions. You know, they're different polling questions. And I think that they are. I think some of you, if this is your first webinar, you might be used to CPE polling questions, which cause you to restate what the speaker just told you. And that's not the intent of the five CPE polling questions that are included in this presentation. The five CPE polling questions included in this presentation are intended as almost like a little bit of a pretest. So I'll be asking some questions, what do you think? And you can then weigh in, and then I'll give you feedback on the answers that you chose. One of the questions in particular is also a way for me to help you because it's going to ask you to make some determinations about the things that are most important to you, and that will help me choose what I want to emphasize in the, in the presentation. So, yes, the CPE questions are included. If you do want CPE credit, you do want that one credit. You do need to answer the polling questions, but they also are a way of pre-testing your, your knowledge. Uh, one one other thing that I, I wanted to say is when we start talking about conflict, this whole subject did come out of your feedback from prior webinars. So we saw the trend in your comments, and we decided to devote this uh, session to this whole subject of you know, what is conflict, conflict and how do we confront it, how to be that confrontational auditor. So keep the comments uh, keep the comments coming. Now, I mentioned the CPE polling questions, and here comes the first one. Weigh in, please. Conflict is just another way of saying that two parties disagree. 
If you think it's true, pick that answer. If you think it's false, pick that answer. And then we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about your your response there. So uh, let's see if we could get your your answers. It looks like we have a fairly split group right there, almost fifty fifty, almost fifty fifty. But the people who said false, I would have to say that's the better the better answer because technically, if you look at this definition of conflict. There's a couple of things that I want to stress. Uh, one is that it's a situation that develops over time. It's the over time. So one disagreement is not conflict. Two disagreements, that's not conflict. But every time we get together, almost every time we get together, so start thinking about those clients where you don't agree on anything. You don't even agree on the time of day. You don't agree on the temperature outside. That. That's a conflict situation. The other point that makes conflict differentiated from just a disagreement is that there is a loss of objectivity, meaning personalities replace the, replace the issues. So when we talk about conflict situations, well, you will definitely know that you're in a conflict situation if the following happens to you, let's imagine that you're in your office and the phone rings and you hear this person's voice. And the minute you hear this person's voice, you think, oh, dear God, why didn't I just let the phone go to cover? If you have that reaction, let me tell you, you are definitely in a conflict situation. One that we do want to prevent if we can and if we can't well we'll talk about how we deal with these difficult situations and difficult people but let's continue with the theory first one more polling slide this is your second polling slide in your opinion where does conflict come from does it come from conflicting ideas and perceptions does it come from group competitions that have kind of run amok does it come from individual competitions that have gone just a little too far or do you think it's all of the above? So, Anne, while people are um, answering this particular polling question, one question we did receive was, are there recommended resources that um, you tell people to read up on this on this particular topic? It's, you know, any magazine articles or, or books that you've recently read? You know, the the skills needed to deal to prevent uh, conflict, uh, some, of the, some of the skills lie in the area of listening. I don't know that, I haven't read any articles on patients. I'm still trying to acquire more than that, but I think that that definitely helps. One of the better books that I read on the subject of pre-conflict, you know, like how do you deal with with things when they're going sideways, is a book by the name um, Crucial Conversations. And Crucial Conversations has been out in the marketplace uh, for a while, but I definitely think that uh, it's one of the better books out there in giving some practical advice on how to deal with, with uh, conflict and, how to, and actually how to confront it and how to work through it. So you might want to start there. Um, I think we have about 93% of the people weighing in. And the answer, all of the above, is absolutely true. And I, I really want to stress that because some people think that it's predominantly conflicting ideas and perceptions between uh, two people, but that's really just not the just not the case. So I just want to touch on these sources of conflict, uh, because they happen a lot, and hopefully they are not happening in, in your organization. But sometimes, sometimes, divisions or strategic business units can have submissions that on the surface appear at odds. So, for example, for example, I, I've been in certain organizations where finance, has been 
in conflict with the businesses that they're supporting. And there's there's a little tension there. You know, there's a little tension there. Uh, in some organizations, there could be tension between operations and IT. I remember one government agency in which I, I was doing some work, and it was really, it was really the epitome of the old line when the elephants fight, the only casualties are the ants. The head of ops and the head of IT couldn't stand each other. And consequently, the people below both of those folks in the organizational hierarchy were really walking around on eggshells. And, and as you can well imagine, if Ops and IT do not get along. If they are not working together hand in glove, not much gets moved smoothly into production. So different missions can, can be one source of conflict. Uh, another source of conflict can be internal group competition. So you have traditionally, the example that I'm citing on the slide is that you have group A and group B, and they're competing. You know, for an award for the President's Club. And slowly but surely, one group starts engaging in cannibalization, meaning taking the other group's customers away, which isn't productive overall to the organization, but it certainly helps, you know, one team win the, win the award. And this is a, you know, these, these conflicts are very debilitating, very, very debilitating. The, the last place where conflict can occur is between individuals. You know, if if you start thinking that some people go a little too far. You know, it's nice to be career minded, but some people take it just a little bit too far. Maybe you think my use of the word obsessed in the slide is a little overblown, but you know, some people just lock and load and they're really just out for themselves, and they don't even they don't even realize it. So, since we see that conflict can occur between one individual and the group, between two teams within a group, and within divisions within an organization, basically the potential for conflict is everywhere. Now, if we marry that knowledge up with the definition of conflict, it's a disagreement, series of them, over time that lead to a condition where personalities replace issues. So the conclusion that I hope you would draw is that we really need to deal with the situations productively as early as possible. So third polling slide for you to weigh in. Now we're going to turn our attention to how you typically deal with these situations, with these difficult people. Do you ignore them? Do you report them to your supervisor so he or she can deal with them? Do you use sarcasm? Do you adjust your response according to their personality? And Anne, while everyone's answering that particular polling question, one of the questions that came in asked, do you have suggestions for conflict between an employee and a supervisor? So do I have advice for a conflict between an employee and a supervisor? And I'm trying to, I'm, that's such a broad question, I'm trying to say to myself, well, gee, is this from the employee's perspective? Is this from the manager's perspective? Is the conflict known? I'm so sorry. I have like so many questions because I could say tongue in cheek in answer to the question, don't let it happen. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I think that question is just so broad. Is there any color you can put to it, Laura? Um, I, I would say it's, uh, the question is coming from the a perspective of the supervisor leading the conflict, especially from a nitpicking perspective. Gotcha. So the, the, the summary advice that I would give would be, if you are not liking what you are getting in an exchange from somebody else, change it up. I know as a supervisor, when I'm in the supervisory role and I start, quote, unquote, micromanaging someone, 
it's generally because I've lost faith in them or I've, I've lost trust in them or I feel that they they need to be uh, more closely managed so that they can succeed. Now, if I'm not good at explaining that change in my behavior, why I'm managing so closely, I, I can see where an employee would think, oh, my God, I, you know, I'm working for a woman that manages me like white on rice. So I, I do think if you're the employee and you're, you're questioning why am I being managed so closely, I would confront the situation, not in a bad way, but I would, I would bring the situation up and say, you know, I, I noticed that you're doing whatever the behavior is, and I, I'd, I'd like to know what I could do to make things easier for you, manager, so that you don't have to manage me that closely. You know, what are you seeing that I'm not, that I'm not seeing? Uh, um, of course, it, some of you are probably thinking, wrong answer, the boss is wrong. And, you know, you might be right. One of the things I've learned in this business is you change one fact. You know, you make the situation just a little bit more specific, and it could completely change, uh, change the way you, you deal with it. But I'm basically saying talk it through. That's basically what I'm saying, whether you're the employee or you're the employer, and change something about your, about your behavior. So let's see what people are thinking about here. So the majority of folks are adjusting their response, which is definitely the the best answer. I would say best answer because I want to be clear. Uh, for the six percent of the people that said that you ignore them, you know, you cannot go to the mat on everything. And I think that when we are, are dealing with with people in life, we need to have a number. My number is three. Some of you who have worked with me know my number is three. First time you do something, uh, and, and I. It, to me, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult situation. It's something that, that um, gets on my radar screen. I, I'm probably not going to do anything. It's the first time. The second time, oh, no, now I'm, now I'm paying a little more attention to it because two times that's not an isolated incident. That's two times. For me, the magic number is three times. Three times, that's a pattern. And I like to talk about things early so that they don't become deeply ingrained. But ignoring it for the first time, perfectly acceptable way of dealing with difficult people. It is not an acceptable way over the long haul. Because if you ignore something for the long haul and then you now make an issue out of it, the other person thinks that you've just kind of, you're having a bad day. You know, you're being just a little, you know, not you. Uh, the idea of reporting things to your supervisor, you know, that's a respectable idea. And some of you were thinking, well, that's why my supervisor gets paid the big bucks for crying out loud. Of course I'm going to re refer these issues. Let my boss deal with it. Well, that's fine. And, and the only thing I would caution you is that when you do that, you are ceding, you are giving up some of your power. And if you don't mind doing that, then okay. You know, okay. Uh, my suggestion would be try to deal with it first. We'll talk about some techniques in just a little bit. Try to deal with it first so that when you pass it over to your boss, you're not only reporting them, but you can talk about all of the positive things that you've tried to do and, and all the ways you've tried to be anticipatory, proactive, and adaptive so that you're, you're, you're minimizing the loss of, of personal power. By the way, I do recognize that some of you work in organizations that are very bureaucratic, and that answer would probably be the best answer in those type cultures. Using sarcasm is technically a means of deflection, technically. You know, you're deflecting it, you're putting it aside. Uh, and sometimes, by the way, the sarcasm can be really funny. Uh, all too frequently, though, the person who's the object of the sarcasm remarkably never seems to get it. Everybody else gets it, but they don't get it. And if you are using sarcasm, do understand that over the long haul, it doesn't work, and it is a form of, technically, it's a form of passive aggression. So really, we have to deal with, uh, productively deal with these, these difficult situations and difficult people. Wouldn't it be something if we could deal with difficult people just like this guy? Thank you for calling customer service. If you're calm and rational, press 1. If you're a whiner, press 2. 
If you're a hothead, press 3 or simply hang up. We're not going to talk to you anyway. Uh, the reality of it is, yeah, we can't deal with them that way. So I would like to give you some practical techniques for dealing with, with different types of people. Here's one more polling slide. Uh, treat this as a quote-unquote needs assessment slide. So the question is, the people I find most difficult to deal with are the ones who are assertive to the point of being aggressive, B, are the ones who agree during the conversation and then say something very different to their boss or when I'm not around. C, are the ones who complain about the work situation and have an inexhaustible list of reasons and excuses as to why things couldn't or didn't get done. D, are the ones who have an answer for everything and act like they're superior. E, are ones who can't make a decision until it would please everyone. And then F, they don't exist. I get along with everyone. So make your choices. And Anne, while everybody's answering that question, could you answer one of the other questions that's come in? This one deals with how do you deal with a, a supervisor that none of the employees understand the directions from? I have worked for people like that. Uh, I, in fact, that sounds like one of my clients before he changed his behavior. Uh, a couple of things. So I'm assuming in the question that the supervisor is unaware that people are not interpreting the instructions carefully. Uh, you might have a supervisor who talks to think, meaning they're a very expressive type, they talk a lot, they talk with a lot of energy, and they literally, they talk to think. And when they're in a meeting and they're giving instructions, if you don't feed back to them, if you don't say something clarifying, like, do you mean blah, 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 or are you thinking about blah, blah, blah? Now, I need to, I need to caveat that answer. I need to caveat that answer. And let me tell you what's going through my mind. You need to know you. If you are a very detailed person, if you're a, a, if you're a very precise person, and you have a manager who talks to think, you have probably one of the worst combinations naturally occurring on the planet. And I'm suspecting that that might be the case because generally an expressive person working with an expressive person will talk things out. Uh, the caveat that I need to place on my advice, which is to use clarifying uh, questions to help the expressive manager think, the caveat is expressive people have little patience for details. So my caveat is be careful that when you're trying to get clarification, it doesn't sound like you're trying to get the other person to do the work. Because that'll be disastrous. That'll that'll almost cause the situation to to be worse. So ask for clarification, but ask for clarification of uh, in terms of the goal. How are you planning on using this? Who do you think is going to be using this? Do, do you see what I'm what I'm getting at? So that you you keep it on a more strategic uh, more strategic level, but definitely get some clarification. So it looks like I have to take a look at this to see. Let me just see where we are here. It looks like we have a fairly even distribution between the aggressive people, the tanks, and then the, the second ones, the snipers, the ones who just kind of, you don't see them coming. It looks like we're okay with the whiner complainers. That's about 20% of the people. You don't seem to mind the know-it-alls, relatively speaking. Only 14% of the people had problem with them. And you don't mind the uh, the fence sitters, you know, the yes people. And I'm laughing at that uh, that person out there doesn't exist. I get along with everyone. Um, I, I can honestly tell you, I don't get along with everyone. I really have to work at a lot of this a lot of this stuff. So let's uh, let's take these one at a time. Let's take these one at a time, beginning with the first one. So let's talk about uh, the the name, you know, calling them the tanks. Uh, you know, these people are so firm. 
they're so confident, they're, they're so uh, strong-willed that they mow other people down and they don't even realize that they've mowed people down. And I wonder sometimes, I, 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 I am taking all of these styles, by the way, uh, as though they are normal, uh, not abnormal psych, meaning this is the person who is just really so strong-willed, uh, not necessarily nefarious about it, but they, they are just very, very strong, and they don't realize the damage that they are doing. As opposed to the tank that's a bully. I'm not talking about the bully. I'm just talking about somebody that uh, is just really overly emphatic. Now, in dealing with this person, like values like. So the tank values people who stand their ground. So if you're going to immediately capitulate, if you're immediately going to back down or take the issue off the table, you will actually unwittingly cause the tank to lose some respect for you. Now, stand your ground does not mean that you should be banging the table and raising your voice. But let's face it, in audit, I'm, I'm, I've got to believe we are coming to the table with technical expertise, with a solid, well-thought-out uh, process and result. We have our facts. If we're gathering information, if we're collecting information, there is a logic, there's a, you know, a, a methodology to our data collection efforts. So you should be comfortable standing your ground. Now, you might be laughing. It says interrupt. You might be thinking, oh, my God, that's so rude. I can't believe Anna's saying interrupt. Well, I go back to my opening statement with the tank, like values, like. The tank wouldn't hesitate to interrupt you if they thought that they had something really important, really meaningful, so basically everything they have to say is really important, really meaningful, they wouldn't hesitate to interrupt you. So you, the time to interrupt the tank is when they, be, they begin to sound like a broken record, when they begin to repeat what they've already said. They won't even notice that you're interrupting. Do not defend your position. Your position should have already been well thought out. There should be a rationale to your line of questioning. There should be logic to the way you're presenting your, your facts. And to get some mutual purpose going on with the tank, when it says aim for the bottom line, really focus on results because that's what the tank is driving towards. The tank is, is typically motivated by getting some, some results. The piece with honor is, you know, let's, let's keep all of the sarcasm out, the indirect, uh, you know, name calling, you know, you're always like that. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. Those kinds of expressions are inflammatory. Find the common ground and grow the common ground when you're dealing with the tank. I'm going to move on to the sniper, which is the second uh, the second type. This is the person who kind of shoots at you when you're not looking, unseen, but definitely very, very lethal. I think the thing about the sniper that is, is just so hurtful, uh, not to mention harmful, is that you think that you're, you're in alignment. And it's devastating to find out, I think it's devastating to find out, that someone's throwing you under the bus, you're saying something very, very different than what they, what they said to your, to your face. I, you know, the fact that it almost sounds uh, like, you know, well, were you lying then or were you, were you lying now? So the sniper, if you, if you do not deal with the sniper when this happens, you, you really um, are creating a very bad situation. So the first thing we need to do with the sniper is find this person. We need to get with this person, and we need to stop for a minute, collect our thoughts, find them, and then backtrack with them in the conversation and say, you know, I, I was talking to so-and-so, and I, and I heard that you're in disagreement with this corrective action, 
And frankly, I was surprised because we had a meeting about it. And at that meeting, it was my understanding that you agreed to this corrective action. By the way, I'm making up the situation, but I'm using this as an example of someone agreeing to something and then completely disavowing, uh, you know, any any agreement. Now, when you do the backtrack, use open-ended questions to get the person to articulate what the what the real source of their objection is. You, where it says ask the relevancy question, you want to find out how their sniping at you is really helping them get to the goal. By the way, I would not use the words, how did your snipe? You know, don't use those words. Don't call what they did a snipe. Just call it what it was. You said one thing to me, and my understanding is you said something different to your boss or my boss. Now, I don't know if it's coming across on the line, but there are a few words that I am using together that I consider, if you will, quote unquote, the magic words. And these are really important words, and they're words that typically we in audit don't use. Words like, it seems to me, I feel that, it was my understanding. Now these these magic words are words that you must, and I know that's a really strong word, but I'm deliberately using it, you must use these words grouped together. Because this way, when the sniper tries once again to disavow uh, any knowledge and, and literally you know, change positions, you're able to say, okay, well, this is my perception, or okay, but these, this is the way I feel about it. Try to get the sniper to talk, and you might have to work at that, because typically the snipers like to hit and run, uh, so that you will have to listen a lot. Uh, you'll have to ask open-ended questions to draw the person out. I think the most important thing is the last point in dealing with the sniper, and it's, I think it's also the most difficult. Don't overreact because you've personalized it. And I think that's really the hard thing because I think the knee-jerk reaction for most people when they find out that they're dealing with a sniper is to take it very personally. Wow, they lied to me. Why didn't they tell me that? You know, and, and you cannot go into the conversation with the sniper feeling that way. It, it will really undermine what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, my comment about suggest a friendly future, here again, point out mutual purpose. You know that old line about when the tide rises, all boats float. Find what you have in common, and maybe all it is is the achievement of the business objective. Maybe that's the only thing you have in common with the, uh, with the sniper. Moving on to the whiner. You know, this is the person who complains and has all of these excuses. Some people call the whiner the Teflon person. If you're familiar with that cooking surface, nothing sticks to the, the cooking surface, nothing sticks to the whiner. They're capable of blaming anybody and everybody, uh, even when everybody else knows that they're responsible. They, they just manage to keep pointing, pointing fi fingers. A couple of things with the whiner when dealing with them. Some some things are easier to do with the whiner than others. Uh, the listening piece, you're not going to listen forever, but you do need to start in a listening mode. You want to start in a listening mode because the whiners generally do have some valid points or a valid point. The problem is they encase it in so much complaining that you're like, oh, my God, I could care less at this point. Please just stop. So do listen to get to the heart of it. Now, in order to get to the heart of what's going on, you need to be prepared to interrupt because keep in mind the whiner will go on and on and on and on and on. So what you need to do is you have to get very specific with your questions so that you're limiting the manner in which they can respond to you. So you will definitely not ask them why they're complaining because now you're putting the emphasis on the complaint. Try to move the conversation to specifically 
what was supposed to happen factually, what was supposed to happen that didn't happen, so that you can get them on a more level, less emotional and whiny platform. As soon as it's practical, so the minute you understand what's the symptom, see if you can get to the cause of the symptom, and then immediately move to problem solving. The whiner will want to complain a little bit more, but let's move to, to the positive. Let's move to, to the, the, more productive, uh, the more productive plane. Now, I think only about 14% of you were feeling that the whiner was difficult. So I'm going to move ahead to the to the know-it-all. And I thought it was interesting. Only about 4% of you viewed the know-it-all as uh, as difficult. This this is the person who tends to speak in very measured tones, low voice If you ask them what time it is, they will generally tell you the different brands of clocks, where they were made, you know, showcasing all of their, all of their knowledge, regardless of whether it's germane to the answer that you need or the decision that you, that you need. They tend to be, not always, but they tend to be analytical and very thorough. They will go over your wording if you're showing them a document with a fine tooth comb. If you are talking to them, they will really listen to your words. So your word choice could unwittingly be the trigger for this know-it-all behavior that you don't like dealing with. So It may seem obvious, but you really need to know your position inside and outside. You need to come to a meeting with the know-it-all very, very well prepared. When you're preparing, prepare for the unexpected, meaning prepare for them to ask difficult questions. Prepare for them to ask questions that kind of cover the subject from 360 degrees. And believe it or not, well, you probably would believe it. If you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. If you were speculating with the know-it-all, it's probably better not to speculate. Just stick with the facts. I personally would reframe how I looked at the know-it-all. Try to see past that annoying persona that reminds you of being six years old and in the first grade. Try to see the person as, a source of reliable information because generally they do have a lot of information and it might be helpful to you in the in the long run to hear them to hear them out if you really want to get the know-it-all on your side definitely acknowledge and value the competency that the that the person brings to the table Moving on to the yes person. This is the fence sitter. This is the person who has difficulty making a decision. Uh, This is the person who, at the end of your, your whole meeting, will say, thank you. Thank you so much. We need to take it under advisement or I need to think about it. Uh, and you're thinking, what do you need to think about it? It should be so clear. It should be so clear. So right out of the gate, when we're dealing with the yes person, the one thing that you really, really want to do, which is push for a decision, is the one thing that you really, really, really shouldn't do. Because as you push for a decision, you are making that yes person less comfortable. And the less comfortable they feel, the more likely they are not to make a decision. And the more likely they are to view you as the tank that we just talked about at the start. So rather than have you become that difficult person that you don't want to deal with or you don't want to become someone else's difficult person, start to figure out where their reluctance is coming from. And that takes me to the second point on the slide. The word unspoken goals. You know, typically the yes people are very sensitive to other people's feelings, and they at all costs 
want to avoid annoying other people or causing other people to become disgruntled. Sometimes the yes people are looking at uh, an aspect of a goal that is unspoken. I mean, you might not even be be aware of it. So try to get people, the yes people, to feel comfortable in talking about so what's holding them what's holding them back? I have found it very helpful to ask yes people to imagine that their boss or team leader was in the room. And if their team leader was in the room, what would their team leader think about the topic under discussion? What would the concerns be? What would the benefits be? And in this way, you can help the yes person talk through the areas that are holding them back. Because at the root of everything with the yes person, we want everyone to be happy. If you're a yes person, you don't want anybody uh, being unhappy. And so by imagining that their boss is in the room, you're really helping the yes person prioritize their response. Uh, One of the other powerful ways to get yes people off the fence and ensure their commitment is by offering them social proof, offering them examples of how what you're recommending or what you're talking about has been done in other areas. So, for example, let's say you're at the start of the audit and you're trying to get some information and they're loath to give you the information. Uh, You know, they think maybe it's a little too sensitive for the auditors to have or, you know, we've, we've not had to answer these kinds of questions before. You could offer up, yeah, that 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 might have been true last year. Uh, this is something we're doing this year, and this department and that department and the other strategic business units have all done this already, and and it's it's been it's been a fine experience for them. That's an example of offering social proof. Similarly, if you have a corrective action plan on the table for discussion, and you're trying to get the yes person to agree to that offering social proof where other departments have had similar issues, they're not alone, and they've taken similar measures in terms of the corrective action, so the yes person's not alone, will help sway the the yes person. So it's, it, you know, it's a, at this point in time that I have to say nothing works all the time. What The advice that I'm giving you works the majority of the of the time. So let's focus now on a situation. Since it's difficult to diagnose others' styles during an intense disagreement, the best thing to do on a consistent basis is state your position logically, have examples to support all of your observations, Listen to what the other party has to say until you understand the message or be prepared to restate your message as many times as necessary until you reach agreement. What do you think the answer is? And Anne, while everybody's answering this polling question, we had an interesting question come in from a person who wants to know what your view is on trying to diffuse the situation by actually calling someone out. And um, in this question, um, the, re- the participant says, by that I mean verbalizing what they're doing, telling, tell them it's not appreciated or it's uncomfortable. And they caveat this question with saying that um, they're asking for all types, not just for the tank or the sniper. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a difference between calling the behavior and calling the person out. And I think we should stay focused on the behavior, and this should be done one-on-one. And if if that's what the person meant by the question, if that's what the person meant by saying calling the person out, um, I think that that's a good thing. Now, I think the word choice in doing that uh, needs to be very fact-based. So you need to you need to be able to specifically tell the other person, and describe the behavior that they did and what its effect was 
on you or the team or the or the organization. So you know, and it would this would apply, by the way, to all of the all of the uh, types. So, for example, if you were one on one with a tank and you were trying to give the tank feedback, you would say to the tank. You know, when we were at that meeting earlier this morning and you made your point and then continued, you know, you, you, you made it uh, and you were very loud and you spoke for five minutes, that didn't give the rest of the group an opportunity to air their views or if it was just you, that didn't give me an opportunity. And I felt that I didn't have an opportunity to speak. When you're describing your side of the conversation, feel free to use the words that I told you before. It seems to me, it's my perception, I feel, really, really own it. But I definitely agree that we should talk about the behavior and we should definitely air it with the person preferably as soon as it happens rather than waiting a week or two you know get your thoughts organized and then and then talk to the person so let's see i think we have a fair amount of people i think we have like 90 percent of the people responding so with this question the operative word in this was best because Quite frankly, stating your position logically is, is you know, that's, that's a nice practice. That's a, that's a solid practice. By the way, I do need to alert you. There are some people that don't make decisions logically. Uh, they make decisions more emotionally. You know, they make decisions based on how the decision will be perceived. So if you're dealing with one of those folks, maybe stating your position logically, um, you've got to reframe what logic means. Um, you know, what, what does logic mean to them? But on, on its face, you know, stating your position logically, for those of you who are auditing finance, who are auditing actuaries, uh, aud auditing people who program, I, I think stating your position logically is, is a good idea. It, it's just not the best uh, answer. Um, having examples to support all of your observations is definitely a fabulous practice, definitely. Uh, and, and something that we should uh, that we should do when when we are in an intense disagreement though sometimes your example could be quote unquote trumped or countered by the other side's example so if we focus on what's the best thing to do c followed by d c is the best thing listen and really listen and listen not only for the words, listen for the feelings that are accompanying those words. Is, is it a feeling of frustration? Is it a feeling of anger? Is it a feeling of shame? What is the feeling? And then listen also for the meaning. What are they really trying to say? You know, and, and, and take that in. Actively engage in restatement as part of the listening. So why are you saying this? So am I understanding this? And don't move the conversation forward until the other person says, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, once you've listened to the words as well as the feeling and the meaning and the other person has said, yes, I agree, now do the last thing. Restate your message one way at a time until you now get it so that the other person hears what it is that you're saying. Now, I'm making, of course, an assumption that you still want to maintain your position after what you just learned. Be open to the possibility that as you're listening to what the other person is telling you, they might introduce new facts, which put things on a very, very different, a very different plane. Let me tie this together in terms of confronting the situation. And I, I want to introduce this model uh, with, with a, an observation. I don't know if you'll find this interesting. I found it fascinating that as we were researching this and putting this together, on my own team, we had very different reactions to the word confront, very different reactions. One of my colleagues was thinking of confrontation as a negative, as an argument. 
Like if, if you have to deal with a confrontation, that meant, oh, wow, we're going to, you know, we could be in an argument. We're going to have to, you know, kind of forestall things. It's going to be difficult. I viewed confrontation as it's positive. We are literally coming face to face. We're literally going to talk things through. And so I'm sharing this model with you because I, I first want you to think about how do you feel about confrontation. And I do challenge you to view confrontation as a positive thing, meaning airing out our differences so that we end up on a, on a, common, a common plane. And so, Crib, clarify goals. What are you trying to achieve? What's the other person trying to achieve? Take it up to the level of the organizational goals. I mean, from an audit perspective, I do think that we're on the side of the angels. We're, we're looking out for the organization as a whole, not just a particular department. Reorganize your strategy and your approach based on what you've learned about the other person. Are they a tank? Are they a whiner? Are they driven by results? Adapt. Identify the mutual purpose that you have. By the way, maybe the mutual purpose is we both want to go home at 5 o'clock. You know, we, we both don't want to work crazy hours. But find that mutual purpose and enlarge that. And then brainstorm with the other person. Are there any other opportunities that, that could be explored? You know, when there's a control gap, there's generally more than one way to close it down. Uh, they, you know, what ideas do they have? Uh, in terms of remediating the situation. So when we think about this whole subject of being that, uh, that confrontational uh, auditor, I'm using the term confrontational not as being rude, but, but rather being very productive, being, being very adaptive. And my parting thought to you is you can't tell people to change their attitudes. You can't. Be happier. You can't say that to somebody. But you can ask people to change their behavior. And, Lark, that goes back to that question about, you know, calling people uh, out, calling the behavior, you know, uh, out and focusing on that. So I think I've allowed about uh, four minutes or so. Maybe we could take some questions, Lark? Definitely. And there's there's one that is a nice segue into what you said. Um, the, the question is, when is a good time to to determine that the situation just can't be rectified. Oh, that's such a sad thought. That is such a sad thought. So so a couple of things. I would say, uh, oh, I'm just organizing my thoughts a little bit. You know, so much depends on what is the situation. I mean, is it auditor, auditee? Is it you and your boss? Uh, you know, is it you and an employee? Uh, you know, another question that floats through my mind is what's really the source of the disagreement? Because if it's an employer-employee situation, the employer is on the hook to produce results through the employee. And so th this is what I'm, you know, this is really what I'm, I'm really kind of, of wrestling with. I, I guess the most general broad-brushed answer I can give uh, to such a broad-brushed question is try at least three different ways to approach the person. Uh, you know, give it give it a chance. Uh, pick even if you pick crib from this presentation and try working that model as you're dealing with people. Earlier in the conversation, I mentioned. I give I give it three times before I would before I would discuss it with a person because one time could be an aberration, second time is coincidental, third time for me is a pattern. That is when I would sit down with someone, look to talk to them. Uh, but I, I I don't know if your your questioner is talking about an existing situation because if anybody participating in the webinar is already in a full-blown conflict situation, you really do need to enlist a third party, a neutral third party, to help facilitate. And uh, so it might be bringing another member of the audit team who has not yet been involved. 
who has the appearance of more objectivity to facilitate the, the, the conversation. In cases when it's an employer-employee situation, the most likely third party would be someone from, uh, someone from HR. Thank you, Anne. We have one minute left, so do you want to take one more question? I, I can if it's a short one. <laughs> Okay. Well, this one is short. It's, it's what if the person out and out lies? Does it go back to getting that get, initial get, party yeah. involved? Get, get the, I would confront the person with the facts. But now, if they're lying for nefarious reasons, I mean, it could be a fraud. It could be, you know, I'm not sure what I, if it's the latter, if it's a fraud, I would definitely escalate. Definitely escalate. They might be hiding something. It might be something bigger. So that I would, I would mention to your in charge or to your manager. Um, sometimes what we feel is a lie is a matter of perception, meaning they didn't get an email or they didn't know a fact. The word lie is a really big word. That's a really forceful word. So I would want to make sure that before we, we use that word, uh, we had all of our facts, you know, in, in, uh, in a row. Great. Thank you for presenting today once again. We had a great, um, great, great audience out there, great presentation, and um, thank you everybody for attending today. Have a great day.